Well, good morning. Welcome to Spring Hill Avenue United Methodist Church. It is a good day to be together and to worship here in the house of the Lord. My name is Jennifer, and I am the pastor here, and it is a joy to welcome you here among us. Before we get started in worship this morning, we have a few announcements. Um, this week, uh, we will be having our regularly scheduled Bible studies. Tuesday morning at 1030 is our, our regular Bible study. Then this, this summer, we are doing a, uh, a series on work and rest and renewal. And there is no required reading ahead of time. Every week we are studying another passage of scripture. So show up with your Bible um, and we'll drink coffee together and dig into the word together. And then on Wednesdays at 9 a.m., we are still carrying on with our eight-week Bible study that is led by uh, Miss Ann Wilcox on the story of David. It is fantastic. So if that is something that you're interested again, uh, interested in again no uh, ahead of time reading required but do bring your Bible um, and we will uh, this one is is truly a study we'll be digging in together and then of course we will still have choir practice this week um, and also uh, a few things to know coming up next Sunday we will have a guest preacher uh, Reverend Lee Allen will be here with us because I will be away um, on vacation. I am. We are going to a family reunion in North Carolina and then taking the kids on a vacation. So we're looking forward to that. And I will look forward to being back again with all of you the following Sunday, the 28th, where we will also have a guidance board meeting. And also that coming week, because I won't be here to remind you next week, though it will be in the bulletin. On that Friday, which I believe is the 26th, our Quad W interns will be celebrating their final evening with us. So please do mark your calendars. Friday the 26th at 6 p.m., we will be hosting here in our fellowship hall a farewell dinner for our Quad W interns. And if anybody is interesting and interested in helping to provide a dessert, that is what our church has been asked to provide for that. So you can let me know or let Kay know, and we will uh, get all of that coordinated. And finally, um, this, uh, this month's mission project and carrying on into August, we are blessing our uh, sister elementary school, Spencer Westlawn. And specifically this year, they have asked not for school supplies, but for uniforms. Uh, they used to receive a grant that helped to defray the cost of uniforms for families that could not provide them for their children, and they did not get that grant this year. So you can see all of the details uh, on the back of the insert in your bulletin, but they are specifically asking for uniform items. You can bring them here and we will get them to Spencer Westlawn, or you can uh, donate money and just put that, that's what that's for in the byline of the check uh, or on the envelope, and we will have somebody to go and do the shopping for you. So with that and our very full hearts that we are together, I invite you to take this time and prepare your hearts for worship. Would you close your eyes and would you just breathe? Breathe in and breathe out. And now let's make that a prayer. Would you inhale the Holy Spirit? the love and the peace and the joy, and would you exhale all things that would distract you, all worry, all fear? Would you inhale God's goodness and mercy and exhale anger and sin? Would you inhale gentleness and peace. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.
We have already begun our worship service and share it to, shared that together, but let us continue as we share our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Please stand and join me. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people. To his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. Join me as we pray together. Father God, teach us how to dance to the rhythm of your wisdom. Show us how to laugh with the insights of your truth. continue our worship as we sing together hymn 555 <coughs> forward through the ages And as we come before the Lord this morning in prayer, we will be praying in a responsive style. So I will prompt you, Lord, in your mercy, and we will respond together. Hear our prayers. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we come before you this morning joyful to be together, because together we find the sort of enduring love that you called hesed, 
loving kindness in the Old Testament, and we find the peaceful love that you called agape in the New Testament. We find you in one another's faces, and together we look to your face and see it shining upon us. But Father, we confess that this morning we also come to you unnaturally heavy, because we are weary of living in unprecedented times. And we are shaken by violence and by the threat of violence. And we know that political violence always waits around the corner like the crouching lion of sin that Cain could not resist. So Father, this morning we pray for healing. We pray for healing for former President Trump and for all those innocent bystanders who were injured senselessly last night. May they make a complete recovery. And we pray for President Joe Biden. We pray protection for him from all those who might seek to harm him in return. And God, we pray for our nation and for our world. Remind us that we are called to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. And God, renew within us and within our hearts the truth that we are not enemies, we are neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Great healer, we also bring before you this morning all those who need your healing. We bring before you those who are waiting for a diagnosis, those who are waiting to start treatment, those who are in the thick of whatever treatment they are in, and those whose illnesses are something more chronic, those who will never get to ring the bell or to proclaim it over, those who are gripped in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Precious Redeemer, we thank you for all of those who lead our churches, and especially this morning. We give you thanks for the ministry of our bishop, David Graves, and for the ministry of our newly elected bishop, Jonathan Holston. Bless them as they transition to their new conference homes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And finally... Our psalm this morning speaks of a time when steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, when righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Will you guide our footsteps upon the path of peace as we recognize with open hearts that you are our peace, so that we may pray with confidence the prayer that your son taught us, your children, to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you are able and to greet one another with the peace of Christ. Peace, friends. And now I invite you to join me in the historic confession of our faith, which you can find printed in your bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. with him 261 and you might have noticed that there's a theme this morning called dance <laughs> and so we cannot omit this hymn from our service this morning and there are lots of words I didn't consult with Becky and Donna how fast they're going to take this you just <laughs> just jump in and hang on <laughs> You may be seated. That's one of those where I have to check my uh, 
microphone very carefully to make sure it's not on so I'm not fully blasting out uh, those of our friends who are worshiping online with us this morning. That's one of my favorites. I love that hymn. And now we take this time to offer back a, a portion of the gifts that God has given us to him. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, God who has taken loaves and fishes and made them abundant, would you take these gifts that you share with us? Remind us that everything we have comes from you, and it is a joy to be able to give it back and watch what you do in our community and in our world as we seek to make it just a bit more here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
week before we start to play as far as I can tell, this is the first Big Three game. This is it, right here. So we own the Big Three game. Anytime you see coaches and other people trying this, they're just they're, they're acting out a biblical thing. They, it's in the Bible. They, we taught them how to do it. So when you have a big victory, you can lead it because you know this. Because you go to church here, you know that this is a church thing. So you can go, man, this is just so bigger. And that's what David did. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the, dance, the victory dances that we see when it's after a game or it's on the field, sometimes when the players are doing it, they're really into it. But sometimes when the coaches do it, you can notice sometimes it's cooler. <laughs> Some of them are better than others at it, right? <laughs> like I've seen it when, like, this, this is a big victory. The Israelites had won back in a battle. They had won back the ark. So all the things that God had instructed them, the law, how to, how to live, the law how, for how to live was in that ark. He even taught them how to build the ark. So this isn't just an average victory. This is the biggest game of their entire lives that they've ever known. They won this battle. So this was a time when the coach was <laughs> definitely going to get involved. And he was definitely going to win. But David didn't do it cool. He did it big. He went all in and he looked cool doing it. Now I've seen, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that there are 49 days left until football season. That's you know, I love it. You know, college football so much. And while I, you know, I'm an Alabama fan, I loved watching Coach Saban, but he didn't, he, he wasn't that great at the victory dances in the locker room. He looked cool. He didn't look that cool doing it always. And, and not all coaches do. But King David, he looked amazing. He looked very cool. He was into it, and he led them. He did it so big, his wife was mad at him because she said, that is not dignified, sir. That you, you need to tone it down. And he was like, no, I can't tone it down. I'm dancing before the Lord with all my might. So I'm just telling you, next time you win a big game, I want to see on social media that you look, you go big, okay? Because you're just following King David. And you can tell your mom, hey, I am dancing before the Lord. Go big, all right? All right, Dominic, I want to see some social media. All right, let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you so much that you teach us how to follow you. You teach us through all of the characters and all the stories that we share together in church and in worship and in Sunday school. You teach us through each other how to love you and how to follow you. Now, teach us that when we dance before you and when we sing your praise, teach us to go big. And y'all can go to Kids Shine with Miss Ann and Miss Lynn. We're going to go dance. Ooh. <laughs> I'm excited about the World Series now, like even more than I already was. Yeah. <laughs> Here now a reading from the book of first or second Samuel, excuse me. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and then skipping ahead, verses 12 through 22. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000, and he and all his men went to Balath in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. And David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who were carrying the ark of God had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets. 
As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. And after he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. And then he gave loaves of bread and a loaf of dates and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people returned to their homes. And when David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Going around half naked in full view of the slave girls as any vulgar fellow in the world. And David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone else from his house when he appointed me to rule over the Lord's people Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. And I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held by them in honor. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, who spoke the world into being with just a word, may we hear your word spoken this morning. And God, who always hears you when we pray, may we hear you. Amen. So, long before I ever had an inkling that God was calling me into ministry as a vocation, I came across a distinct cultural artifact, a movie, that reveals to all who watch it the power of dance to reconfigure power, to break down barriers between family members, and to heal broken hearts. And I am speaking, of course, of the 1984 musical drama Footloose, in this cultural classic, a young man from Chicago moves with his single mother to a small town in which a local pastor has successfully influenced the town council to ban all dancing as a means of protecting the young people in the community from the dangers of underage drinking follow him here, because of course this was the cause of Reverend Moore's own son's death. And the movie follows our protagonist, Wren, and Reverend Moore's daughter, Ariel, who of course fall in love, as they seek to change the town's mind about dancing with dancing. It's a ridiculous movie. And my favorite part has always been the commitment of this teenage boy from Chicago who is portrayed as something of a punk to dancing. I'm not sure that the idea of dancing automatically screams anarchy to me, but there is something about the freedom of dancing that scared good old Reverend Moore, and that's an opinion that David's wife Michael also shares. So our scripture today opens on a scene that would have been difficult for me to describe to you before I had the good fortune of living in Mobile, Alabama. But now I know that I simply need to ask you to imagine Mardi Gras. Or at least take Mardi Gras as your starting place, but imagine we hadn't been allowed to celebrate it for a good 20 years. Because this is the kind of celebration that comes about when the Ark of the Covenant is returned to its rightful place after 20 years away. This is the celebration that happens when the Lord, Yahweh, is publicly returned to his rightful place at the center of Israel's political and religious life. And this celebration is totally understandable and yet wholly out of the ordinary at the same time. 
allow me to refresh your memory on a few hundred years of history. Hang on. When the Lord delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt, he claimed them as his own and he made a covenant with them. And he said to them, I will be your God and you will be my people. And he gives them commands to follow and he told them his name, Yahweh, which means something like, I am what I am or I am what I will be. Basically what God is saying is, you will know who I am by what I do. And what God does over and over again is stick with his people. Even when they mess up, even when they fail, even when they turn their backs on him. Y'all, he had not even finished giving Moses the commands, the terms of the covenant the first time when the people of God panic that they hadn't heard from God recently enough and make for themselves a new God to worship. A golden calf that they know is not powerful like Yahweh, but it looks like what all the other nations have, so they decide it's better to be sorry than secure in the Lord's care. And after that particular failure, the Lord gives his people something like what the other nations have, something they can point to when they find that their nerve is failing, the Ark of the Covenant. He says, there I will meet you, and from the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the side of the Ark of the Covenant, I will deliver to you all my commands for the Israelites. And this ark that is housed in the tabernacle becomes the symbol of the Lord's presence among his people. And for hundreds of years, they marched the ark before them into battle, a visible sign not only to those against whom they are fighting, but a reminder to themselves of who it is that they belong to, a reminder of who it is that is with them, a reminder that they are under the Lord's protection. However, after a few hundred years recorded in the book of Judges, God's people had more or less forgotten who they were again. They were still marching that ark into battle before them, but the Bible tells us that in those days there was no king in Israel and all the people did what was right in their own eyes. And so God's people decided yet again that what they really needed was what all those other nations have. And this time, they decide it's a king. It's a king to lead them. So God gives them a king, just like all the other nations have. A guy named Saul. And Saul continues this pattern that the people of Israel have come to embody. See, Saul knows that Yahweh is supposed to be in charge. He knows that with Yahweh, the people of God, God's chosen people have power. But he also knows that no other nations seem like they have kings who are constantly submitting. Who are constantly submitting to a god because it looks to him like all the other kings just make sacrifices to their gods and then tell them what they want. Saul never understood. See, he also thought that he had to be the guy. And his reign is marked by his indecision, by this passionate yo-yoing between attempts to be obedient to the Lord and desperate attempts to keep all the power for himself. And that's the fundamental difference between Saul and David, who is Saul's successor. See, the Bible tells us that David is a man after God's own heart, which really just means that David is a man who is seeking God's heart. We talked a few weeks ago about how when Saul was frozen with indecision over what to do about the Philistines and this champion giant they have, Goliath, David knew what to do immediately because David remembered God's faithfulness to him when he was a shepherd protecting his sheep from lions and bears. And now David has been made king. 
He has created a kingdom. He has rallied all these disparate 12 tribes together until they formed a nation. He is building a stronghold in Jerusalem. He is more successful than Saul had ever been, and he is still seeking God. The Bible tells us that before he makes a move, he asks God things like, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? 2 Samuel 5 tells us that David did just as the Lord commanded him. And thus it is that David, who had always been Yahweh's man, decides that he's going to retrieve the ark from where it's been in storage for the last 20 years. Because David is doing the work to establish the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. But it's not good enough for him alone to be seeking the will of the Lord in his heart on their behalf. He wants the physical representation of the Lord and the Lord's presence to be central to the nation. He wants the people to remember that his political power comes from the Lord. He wants the people to know that it is Yahweh who has always given his people victory. And he wants the people to know that his allegiance, and by extension, their allegiance, should be to Yahweh. So it is that David goes to get the ark, and he is appropriately awed. He recognizes that the power of the Lord does indeed reside there, and it is not a tame power. It is not to be wielded however he sees fit, the way that Saul had tried to do. Instead, Yahweh is the Lord, who can be sought, who desires to be sought, and who will answer. So, David and his 30,000 men start their procession to Jerusalem with the ark. And they sacrifice an ox and a fatling. And there is singing and there are lyres and there are harps and there are tambourines and there are castanets and there are cymbals. And the people of the Lord are dancing their way all the way to Jerusalem and into it. And David puts on a linen ephod, which is like a priestly loincloth, and he danced before the Lord with all of his might. And I imagine that it was a, a leaping, shouting, singing kind of a dance, because that's what made sense. And he's handing out cakes of bread and meat and raisin cakes to everybody. This man is overcome with joy. And out of that overflowing joy, he is blessing everybody. And I should warn you that even in the face of overwhelming joy, not everybody is going to think that's a good thing. David's own wife, Saul's daughter, Michael, certainly does not. The writers of 2 Samuel tell us that as the ark of the Lord came into the city, Michael, daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She sees this unseemly, undignified display, something that is not controlled, something that is not appropriate for a king. And maybe it's not. But see, the Lord has never been super concerned with what is appropriate. See, this is the same God who is going to choose to come among us as a human, who will associate himself with sinners and tax collectors, who will allow women to sit and learn at his feet in a time when women were certainly not allowed to be disciples of a rabbi, this is a man who is going, a God who will come among us and tell the woman at the well that worship is not about location, but it's about worshiping in spirit and in truth. And that is great news for us. That is the best news. All we have to do is worship. 
but you may have noticed that if we humans have a superpower, it is that we can take the best gifts and turn them into the stickiest of traps. David danced before the Lord. Jesus said, worship in spirit and truth. Jesus' followers were accused of being drunk when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And somehow what we heard was sit up straight, don't wear the wrong clothes, and only the right kind of person is allowed to sit in that pew. We laugh at the absurdity of a, of a movie like Footloose. But what about our own absurdity? What about the absurdity of God's people? When David finally comes to his household to bless it, the way that he had blessed everyone else in Jerusalem, Michael confronts David and she accuses him of dishonoring himself. And David responds, it was before the Lord that I danced. And I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But those maids of whom you spoke, by them I shall be held in honor. I will become even more undignified than this. That's the part that gets me. That's what sticks with me. Because David knows it's undignified. David felt awkward. He's a warrior. He knows what to do on a battlefield. He is a king. He knows how to hold court. But ultimately, above it all, he is a man after God's own heart, and he is used to seeking God's will. And when he comes into the presence of the Lord, he is compelled to dance. And maybe it looked goofy. <laughs> maybe it didn't. The point isn't really what it looked like, but that the man who had been tasked to lead God's people led them in worshiping the Lord. So what does it look like to worship in spirit and in truth? Should we ask Chris and Miss Becky and Miss Donna to rock out while we dance down the aisles next week? As much as I dearly love to dance, I don't think that's quite it. But it is simple. Worshiping in spirit and in truth really is as simple as be present, be attentive, and be real. The first one's kind of obvious, but it matters that you are present. It's hard to build a habit of worshiping in spirit and in truth if you are never here. And before you protest, yes, of course you can be a Christian without going to church. Yes, of course you can go on vacation. Yes, of course there are times when you are ill or you are immunocompromised and you need to be away from our church family. But that's meant to be an exception or a season, not the norm. The Lord made us for relationship and we are formed as disciples in the company of one another. If the Lord really is present in you and through you, and he really is present in me and through me as the hands and the feet of Jesus, then I need you and you need me. We need each other to worship rightly. And the second, it's like the first, be attentive. In other words, don't just show up physically be here and expect God to be here too. And if you find that you don't actually expect God to show up in worship with us, well, have you prayed about it? Have you asked God to be present with you, to be present in worship? Because worship is not meant to be a passive verb. Chris and Miss Becky and Miss Donna and I are all here to make it a little easier to worship but we certainly can't make it happen for you. But the curious thing is, if you are worshiping, I am worshiping, and she is worshiping, and he is worshiping, it sure does make it easier for the person next to you to worship too. And finally, and this is the hard one, be real. 
I say it's hard because we expect certain things out of worship here in the church. We expect a certain amount of decorum, of appropriate clothing, of right actions. But I would submit that no amount of appropriate clothing or words or actions can substitute for the experience of real worship in a real community of believers. I was reading a study recently which suggested that far and away the biggest reason that Gen Z gives for not attending church is hypocrisy. However, it's not that they don't believe in God. They are the most spiritual of all the generations. It's not that they don't believe in God, it's that they don't trust religious institutions. And if we're honest with ourselves, we can understand why. So, what would it look like to bring your whole self with all your flaws, with all your sadness, with all your questions, and all your joy? into the house of the Lord. There was this weird period back in the 1990s when suddenly swing music and swing dancing was everywhere all over again. It was so everywhere that for three weeks in 1998, the Brian Setzer Orchestra was in the Billboard Top 100 with their cover of Louis Prima's song, Jump, Jive, and Wail. And there was this series of gap ads all over the television with swing dancers joyously dancing and flipping and slinging each other around. And I was obsessed, y'all. That's why I had to learn how to swing dance. And that's how I learned that swing dancing is actually just a simple set of steps. There is really nothing at all complicated about it. East Coast Swing is really just triple step, triple step, rock step. That's it. But when you know that, when you have that down, that's where the improvisation comes in. There's an art to what those dancers in the Gap ad were doing, but it all comes back to those simple steps. Triple step, triple step, rock step. Well, that and following your partner. Because it turns out that that's the difference between David and Saul. That's what David understood that Saul never did. Saul understood how to look like an appropriate leader. But David understood how to follow his leader, his dance partner. And sure, Maybe he felt a little foolish in the beginning out there in that linen ephod, but he trusted the steps he had known since he was just a little shepherd boy. And he trusted the Lord's leading. So this morning, I wonder, what will it look like for you to dance the simple steps of being present, being attentive, and being real? And will you let the Lord lead you as your dance partner? You might just discover a joy in worship that isn't just for you. You might just discover a joy that you can't keep to yourself. A joy that draws others into the dance as well. And wouldn't that be a reason to dance for real? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Would you pray with me? Lord of the dance, you who have been leading us in a dance since you set the stars in the sky and set the planets spinning in their orbits, since you created the trees of the field and the birds of the air, the rocks that you tell us would cry out were we not to praise your name. Would you lead us in the dance as well? Would you make us open to your leading so that as we go out into the world, led by you, 
others would experience your joy and your peace and want to join in. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As we respond this morning with the first and last stanzas of hymn 338, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow, He Will Be Leading You, You May Stand, and if you are dancing in place or in the aisle, the, tr the triple step fall on the dotted quarter notes of each measure. Stand as we share this hymn together. As you go into the world, would you go with this blessing? May you go into the world acknowledging that things are more complicated than we know how to hold together. But we know the one who says that he can hold together even the concepts of righteousness and peace so strongly that they embrace one another. So God, would you lead us, and would you empower us to follow, so that your grace may be apparent to all of those we encounter. Go now in peace. Amen. <laughs>